Graeme Stewart, Minister of State for Energy, Security and Net Zero. We'll talk a little bit about your policy area towards the end of this interview, but this is primarily about you and who you are. So you went to private school, you go to Cambridge University, but you fail your degree. What happened? Well, you can imagine how upset my dad was. Um, and sadly, when I was elected to Parliament, which I felt was like giving him something back, but he died of cancer in January 2005 and I wasn't elected till later that year. But uh, I felt, uh, yeah, he would had to fight very hard. He's from a Glasgow council house. I don't think he'd even had all the teachers he needed to become a doctor. He'd had to win a scholarship by staying an extra year at school. So um, you can imagine, he struggled. I, but as I said to him, I said, you have your upbringing, I have mine, and we've both got to find our own way. Were you gutted when you failed? No. <laughs> I, I, was, I was busy. I, I, I had, uh, after school, after 10 years of all-male Scottish boarding school, I went to California. Oh, what a joyous release that was. And uh, eventually my parents dragged me back to go to university. I rode, I was involved in politics. I was chairman of the Conservative Association. I started my own publishing business at the end of my first year. By my third, it was paying me more than a job would. So I decided, I'd always wanted to go into politics since I was at school. I thought I'd go into, I'd, become an entrepreneur, create jobs, um, create wealth, and then go into politics. So I wasn't overly fussed about my degree. I was much, much more upset about the failure to catch uh, the boat in front of me in, the, uh, in that year's boat race. All male boarding schools, are they, are they brutal places or is that a stereotype that doesn't... That's... I mean, most of my friends, I think, enjoyed, the, enjoyed it. I happen not to, so... Uh... Most of the time, I shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't colour anything all one way or another. I didn't particularly uh, enjoy it and uh, so, but, it, you know, apart from the tick and the difficulty talking to women, um, otherwise it's left me unharmed. <laughs> You've been serious? Do you reckon it does when you're in a single-sex school, particularly a boarding school, do you reckon it does uh, create difficulties talking to the opposite sex? Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's been a lasting problem. Okay. Um, <laughs> OK. OK. Right. I'm, I'm really keen to get to see this event through your eyes. On the 19th of October 2022, there was this controversial fracking vote uh, that the government had declared a vote of no confidence. But during the debate, you were at the front bench, you were speaking from the, from the dispatch box, and you rejected any suggestion that the impending vote was more about confidence in Liz Truss and her government than it was about fracking. That vote arguably played a big role in her demise. She was, she was gone within, within days. What happened that night? Well, uh, I was ready, as you say, to sum up I, at the end of rather, a, a, in a packed house, uh, in rather a fractious uh, debate, when I suddenly got the message behind, have you seen your phone, Graham? And this was two minutes before I had to begin the summary, summing up at the dispatch box. And uh, I said no, and I looked at it, and it said, you, you know, number 10, want confirmation that you'll say it's not a, a confidence vote. So I was like, okay good soldier, I'll say it. So I stood up. I, to be fair, uh, I tried just to slip it in. I hoped people might just describe it to me. I said, Mr. Speaker, what a great debate. Um, technically, it's probably not a confidence vote, but blah, blah, blah. To be fair to Ed Miliband, he was hot to trot on it. He, he's been around and he was bouncing up and down uh, relentlessly. So uh, eventually, and, and uh, people behind me were getting a little um, spooked as well. So uh, basically I did what I was uh, told to do, which is to say it wasn't a confidence vote after it had been sent out earlier that it was. So it did lead to and contribute to a sense of chaos, um, I think, at the time. And uh, Ed Miliband, eventually I think I gave way by saying to Mr Speaker, I'd better let the right honourable gentleman come in or he may, he may burst a blood gasket. Um, so Ed came in and, uh, and made the point as well. So, And there we are. And then we won, of course, the vote absolutely crushingly uh, anyway so uh, but it's one of those things under under pressure I guess. Did you have a stiff drink after that night? Yeah yeah I did and uh, and of course the following day uh, Liz Truss resigned so my temporary sojourn in the cabinet came to an end. Uh, that night I was on question time and I had everyone coming on number 10, number 10 on, are they saying, are you're pulling out of question time? To which I said, well, I don't think so. And then everyone through the day was telling me, are you, are you actually going on? Until eventually Fiona Bruce 
took me with both hands on my arm and said, oh, can't, we can't believe you're here. At which point I was thinking, what am, <laughs> I, am, I, what am I doing here? <laughs> Personal question now. You separated from your wife last year. Of course, I don't know, need to know the details of what happened. Obviously, it's upsetting for everybody involved. But what I did want to ask you about is whether parliamentary working, the fact that people are away from home for most of the week. Does parliamentary working contribute to families breaking down or put a strain on families? Uh, well, I, as I mean, I, the divorce rate is pretty high in Parliament, but um, so yeah, it puts, it puts strains on families and depending on where you live as well, of course, if you don't move together and you're separated, then it can put, uh, put pressure on. So uh, uh, it can do, but I, been married what 33 years we've got two lovely daughters and um, Anne and I still have a, uh, a good relationship so uh, you know uh, I, I'm grateful as I think she is for uh, what we've uh, what we built together um, I'll be it will now be doing it separately okay so I was looking at old interviews uh, that you have given because you've been in Parliament since 2005 I know. Um, so you were there as uh, that Labour government, one term, and then you were there as that Labour government uh, lost power. So this is an interview with The Guardian uh, 10 years ago. You said you wanted public spending cut faster and that you deplore welfare dependency. Just wonder, 10 years later, does Graeme Stewart still hold the same views? Have you changed your mind on anything? Um, well, you probably have changed your mind on some things, but the fundamentals... And I'm believe in trying in the virtue of work of trying to make work pay I'm proud of what this government has done uh, you know one of the you know the tropes against labor governments and it's a fair one is that they always end up with higher unemployment at the end than the beginning there's no dignity um, in that uh, so getting people into work which we have done with the, you know the kind of uh, very high uh, employment rates by making work pay raising the living wage, um, I think we've made an enormous positive difference to people's lives in terms of their dignity, uh, their ability to work and the income that they brought home as well. And that's a conservative vision rather than people being trapped in dependency, which is what I abhorred, um, and especially with that kind of rather unhealthy relationship, uh, as I would see it with the Labour Party, where economic dysfunction actually contributes to electoral success. And what you've got to do is make sure that that's not the case. So I, was, I remember saying to a new MP uh, in Hull, and I was saying, well, your predecessor was, uh, you know, her, was 30 years ago was saying how dreadful everything was, and 30 years on, they're not any better, even after 13 years of Labour government. So, you know, I hope, you know, that any of us, regardless of our politics, would make sure that the people we represent were better off, had more dignity, better able to make their own decisions in lives, and could carry on thinking that all government was useless and irrelevant, because that's what happens. You know, people can be like that when they've got control of their own lives, and that's a very conservative principle, which I hold strongly to. OK. Let's look at your brief. So when you look at opinion polls, everyone says, we want to save the planet, we want action to save the planet. If you ask people, but what if it personally affects you? What if, if, if you have to have a low traffic neighbourhood, so you have to pay to, to drive locally, or that you won't be able to have a new gas boiler because there won't be any gas boilers? The enthusiasm for the net zero project wanes significantly. Do you think the public are being heard on those concerns? Um, well, I, I guess they are, but equally, the science is just cruel, isn't it? And it gets m the consensus gets stronger and stronger. If we don't uh, peak our emissions pretty well immediately um, and have significant cuts by 2030, then the planet will continue to heat up. The weakest and poorest on the planet will suffer the most. So that's the kind of big picture. But you're right, uh, Gloria, to say we've also got to bring it down to people's everyday lives. Well, I think in the UK, notwithstanding some of those uh, personal interventions, as you say, that could at times be unwelcome. But we've got a tremendous opportunity. Every, when we took over the COP presidency, you know, the, the UN process, only 30% of global wealth was covered by net zero pledges. At, by the time we'd finished, it was 90%. So the world, you know, uh, people who have to worry about getting re-elected all over the world have recognised the science is uh, pretty unarguable. 
But if you look at the UK and you see all our offshore wind, which we've done a tremendous job of developing um, under this government, I'm very proud to say, if we capture all of the renewables that we've got, we convert that into hydrogen, which is an important part of the future, and we make use of uh, the carbon capture that we have in the North Sea, you know, depleted oil and gas wells. We took wealth out in the form of oil and gas. We can put carbon back in there and provide a service to the rest of Europe. So I think going forward, there's a real chance that we could actually have amongst the most competitive uh, electricity uh, prices in Europe uh, in a largely electrified economy. So there's more jobs. And where are they likely to be? the North East, the North West, Scotland, Wales, the very areas which uh, when you talk about levelling up, which might apply to the whole country, but means most, I think, in those, those industrial areas of the country that felt left behind. So, so I think the net zero, although it's seen as some sort of green conceit by some, actually offers an opportunity for economic uh, renaissance for the UK and industrial renaissance. And uh, that's very much the vision that Grant Shapps and my department and I are pursuing um, to deliver a low cost, green system in which uh, you know people are not paying through their uh, with jobs and prosperity for what is an essential uh, response to the science and finally what do you say to the mum who says i've got to drop my my kids off at school it's costing me a fortune to the handyman uh, who says this is my lifeline i have to drive with my van to get to work they probably not with you because they're paying an arm and a leg. Oh, well, the aim very much is to see, as we have seen, is the cost of green uh, industries and services coming down. I mean, offshore wind, just off my patch, it was £120 a megawatt hour in 2015 auction. Um, by just two auctions later in 2019, it was £39.50. Rolling out um, uh, renewables is actually lowering the cost of our energy system. It's, it's expensive um, fossil fuels which are making everyone's energy bills so high at the moment. So at the, we are going hell for leather to increase and capture all the green energy. And if we can do that properly and, and have the grid and the charging infrastructure, then the cost of charging your car should t uh, turn out in long term to be lower, I hope, than that of sticking in some filthy substance which you then burn, poisoning the air for all of us. So I, I, it's not, I don't think there's a, a contradiction there. I'm not saying it's entirely cost-free and there isn't some inconvenience, but I think the vision that we can deliver is of a greener country that leads the world, develops the technology, sells those solutions elsewhere, and does so in a way which leaves us as the most competitive economy in Europe. If we can deliver all that, then we've done right by the planet, but we've also done right by the handyman driving uh, his van and able to go and service um, you know, families up and down the country and look after them in an affordable way. Graeme Stewart, thank you very much indeed.